Okay, so if you didn't guess from our songs and our morning message, we're going to continue to talk about revival. And I have quite a few passages. You might want to turn to Psalm 119 and get right near the beginning. I don't remember which verse is the first one we'll look at, but we will look at a number of verses in Psalm 119. I'm afraid they're not all in order, but at least you'll be in the right place if you want to be have your Bible open to a spot. So this morning I uh, encourage you to develop the steady, confident, abundant life of a disciple. And uh, this, this kind of life is a revived life. This is, um, this is what we, uh, we really want to inculcate in the lives of our people in our church. Now in North America... Revival has come to refer to a kind of intense spiritual change or, or uh, uh, among a significant group of people where many seem to get right with God all at once. So uh, you see the sign that I have as part of the opening slide here. Old time Bible revival every night, 745, all welcome. Evangelist Everett Wilson of Emporia, Kansas is uh, on that sign. Now, uh, historically, uh, several key events solidified the desire and expectation of revival among Christians. There was, in, in the seven, late 1730s, there was something called the First Great Awakening. Jonathan Edwards was a primary local preacher in, North, in New England who was involved in that. George Whitfield was involved in that, preaching up and down the east, eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, it wasn't the United States at, the t- at that time. It was the colonies. And they, they, were, they received tremendous uh, responses. Jonathan Edwards preached a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And as he preached, he used the image of a spider dangling from, its, from a web over a fire. And he said, you are the spider and that web is your life. And if you don't repent, you're going to the fire, essentially, was the theme of the message. Now, and he read the message in a high, thin voice, they say, and, uh, you know, in a monotone, and people were crying out in the pews for God to save them from their sins. So, it was a remarkable time. Jonathan Edwards wrote a book on, um, on that revival, the surprising work of God, it's called. He was testing. There were some people, as the emotionalism spread, some people who would make claims of repentance, but then it seemed to be false. And so he was trying to determine or show whether or not this was a genuine work of God or not. And his conclusion was that it was. Now, of course, the first Great Awakening, then later on, the second Great Awakening came in the late 1700s to the mid-1800s. Uh, the Charles Finney revivals were part of this. Charles Finney used, he was the one who introduced all kinds of means. He introduced what's called the mourner's bench or the invitation, calling people forward into the beginning, front of the church, calling people to repent. Uh, that has developed into sometimes evangelists will have a meeting and they'll play an invitation song and they'll go on and on and on until someone breaks and will come forward. And it, can, it has received a lot of criticism. But any of the Second Great Awakening. Then we had the Moody revivals in the late 1800s. Charles uh, Dwight L. Moody preaching all over America and in England and many responses to the gospel. Then after him, there were lesser, lesser revivalists. R.A. Torrey, a successor of Moody's, co-worker and a successor, had big revivals. And there were others, Sam Jones, Billy Sunday, Bob Jones, who founded Bob Jones University, uh, Gypsy Smith and many other names in this um, uh, group. Uh, in the late 1800s to early 1900s, these men would come into a town. They would set up a, a, be- a place of meeting, a tent sometimes. Sometimes it would be a tabernacle the churches would build. And they would, and often it would be sponsored by many churches in the town. And there would be meetings every night. And people would come. It was sort of like... You know, they didn't have movies, they didn't have television, they didn't have radio. So let's go listen to the preacher. 
And so it was sort of, in a way, entertainment, but it was a time when many people made real decisions to follow the Lord Jesus and repented of their sins and so forth. Well, uh, the, um, sometimes they established new churches uh, out of these meetings. Now, Billy Graham was the last really well-known revivalist. He called his meetings crusades. Uh, he would have certain sensational conversion stories. Some of them were legitimate and some were not. Uh, famously in Los Angeles, Mickey Cohen, a mobster, uh, came to uh, one of his meetings, made a profession of faith, and there are the news, Mickey Cohen has become a Christian. Except he had the idea, I can be a Christian gangster. <laughs> It didn't quite translate, and uh, it was one, not one of the shining lights of Billy Graham's ministry. Now, some of Billy Graham's ministry certainly was. He did reach people. I, I, I don't want to deny that. Now, here's how Mer Merriam-Webster defines revival. An act or instance of reviving, the state of being revived, that's not very helpful, as a renewed attention or, to or interest in something. Or B, a new presentation or publication of something old. Or C, and this is what we're interested in, a period of renewed religious interest. Or two, an often highly emotional evangelistic meeting or series of meetings. That's what the word revival has come to mean. Some southern churches still hold revival meetings, even though they are usually sponsored by just one church. They'll have an evangelist in. And they are, they will, as we said, we talked about the invitations, we talked about things that they've done. We've had some evangelists in. I'm not completely satisfied with that ministry as such anymore. But uh, some of them are quite manipulative in how they approach uh, the invitation, their attempts to persuade people to change for the Lord. I think many of the men themselves are sincere, but their methods are sometimes misguided. So, in thinking about the term revival, I thought we should simply look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about it. So, I'm going to give you a proposition before the scripture today. Here's the proposition. The Bible sense of revival comes from God when God's people humbly seek God in God's ways. Okay, at his ways. The Bible sense of revival comes from God when God's people humbly seek God and his ways. And I think this is what we want to stir up in our own Group. So, first of all, defining revival. Defining revival is our first point. All right, so there's two Old Testament accounts that speak of resurrections as revival. And, uh, by the way, uh, all of my references are in the Old Testament uh, today. Uh, there's, I think there's maybe one reference in the New Testament that speaks of a revival of some kind, but it's not has nothing to do with what we're looking for, a spiritual revival. So... But I do want to mention these. These are some of the early mentions of revival, the word revival in the Old Testament. So this is uh, 1 Kings 17. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Now, you say, well, that's not spiritual revival. No, it's not. But just hold that idea, because we want to uh, think about that and thinking about what we mean by revival. All right, then 2 Kings, there's a similar story. This is, you remember... Uh, we've talked about this recently, I'm pretty sure. The prophet who had, uh, who had been sent to warn Jeroboam about his sins. Did we talk about this recently? And he was told not to go back, uh, or not to eat anything, to go back and, and go back to uh, the land of Judah where he came from and not stop on his way, don't stay overnight, don't eat anything. And then eventually he, he disobeyed and he was killed by a lion. Now, do you remember me talking about this recently, anybody? Okay, Cullen remembers. Okay, good. At least somebody does. I know we've talked about it some uh, sometime fairly recently. Anyhow, he was buried in a cave right next to the prophet who dissuaded him, who eventually died, and he was buried in the same plot place. Now, in this uh, verse, Second Kings thirteen twenty one, there was a man who was killed in battle, and it says, as they were burying a man, behold, they saw a marauding band, and they cast the man into the grave of Elisha. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong story. I've got my stories all mixed up. But anyway, they cast the man into the grave of Elisha, and when the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Now, how would you like that? 
Okay, so you you got your buddy. He's just died in battle, and you're all oh, it's terrible. Oh, there's come soldiers coming. Let's get rid of the body quick. They throw him into this cave, and all of a sudden he stands up. You know, he's healed. He's alive. He's revived. Anyway, either way, the point he has made. I think there's something about the bones of that prophet where he revived somebody too, but it's not. They don't use the word revival, so that's what confused me. Now I want to make some observations from these stories. These two individuals who revived had physical life. They both died. And then God miraculously brought them back to physical life. So I want to apply that to a spiritual revival. A spiritual revival happens in someone who already has spiritual life. In other words, they're not lost, they're actually believers. They're believers whose lives have become deadened in their spiritual life. I, this morning I was talking about don't go weary in well-doing, right? So that's a deadening. I've been talking in the book of Hebrews about hardening your heart towards God. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of deadening of the spiritual life. People get tired, they get upset, they begin to hold a root of bitterness. It is called somewhere else in Hebrews. We haven't got there yet in our study. And so, and they begin to they begin to slack off in their Christian life. They begin to miss church. They begin to grow sour. They begin and they and they are they're just not doing anything for the Lord. They have deadened their spiritual life. Well, God intervenes when a revival happens. God intervenes to bring that person back to spiritual life. So, to my mind, that is what a revival is. I think, to a certain extent, all of us need revival at various points in our spiritual life. There are times when you're physically tired and you just say, oh, you know, I, I, sh I know I should go do whatever. I should go to church or I should read my Bible or I should talk to that person and I'm just so tired. I'll do it later. We need a little bit of revival. Well, we may need to have some sleep and get going again the next day. But we need a little bit of revival. Or maybe there's something where, oh, that guy, he sure made me mad. And I'm just, if he's going to be at church, I'm not going to be there. All right? So there's, we need a revival. We need a change in our heart to think rightly about that person. So I want to note some passages in, in uh, the scriptures where, it's, where prayers are made for revival. So let's look at a few of them. We can find several of these. In the Old Testament. Here's Ezra 9, verse 8 to 9. Now, but now for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us an escaped remnant and to give us a peg in his holy place. This is the captives coming back to Judah. That our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. For we are slaves, yet in our bondage our God has not forsaken us but has extended loving kindness to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to rise up, raise up the house of our God, to restore its ruins and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And so they're praying here for uh, and acknowledging what God has done, but praying for revival. Here's another one. Psalm 80, verses 17 to 19. The psalmist says, Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man, who you made strong for yourself, then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us. We will, we will call upon your name. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. So the psalmist is crying out to God for revival. Another one in Psalm 85, verse 6. Will you not yourself revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? And then Psalm 143, verses 10 through 11. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For the sake of your name, O Lord, revive me. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. So praying for revival. There's several examples. There's a few more. If you uh, have a Bible program and just search on the uh, word Revive, I, the way I did this one is I put, I think, R-E-V-I-V -V asterisk, and then it was able to search for different forms of the word. You can see how it's used. Sometimes it doesn't apply, but many of the, most of the references do speak towards a spiritual revival, coming back to life again. And uh, along with these prayers come urgings for revival. 
Here's the psalmist says, the humble have seen it, the works of God, and are glad. You who seek God, let your heart revive. Now this seems to indicate that there is, uh, there, there is something that the individual needs to do in order to experience revival. We can pray for revival. We can ask God to revive our hearts. We can ask God to revive our church. But there is something that you and I need to do in order to experience revival. And we need to let our heart revive. We need to accept what God is saying to us. We need to let him do the work in our lives. So all of these references are in the Old Testament I mentioned, um, especially in the Psalms. But we who live in the New Testament era can nevertheless appropriate these prayers for our own spiritual lives. All right, so the next thing I want to add here is the source of revival. Here's where we're going to Psalm 119. I found this very fascinating. And actually, this is what sparked this idea for the message was something I read just the other day in Psalm 119. If you're using the same schedule I am, part of your reading is in Psalm 119 right now. We're about uh, a third of the way through it, I think, in, in the reading. But here, I'm going to put the four of them up on the screen here. The first one is in verse 25. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Then there's another one in verse 50, which is very similar. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your word has revived me. And then all the way down to verse 107. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. And then last, Psalm 119, verse 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. So one of the sources of revival, and it's mentioned four times here in Psalm 119, is what? The word of God. So if you feel that you have, your spiritual life is deadening, that you're growing cold to the things of God, that you're resisting or uh, God, you're hardening your hearts in some way, a key thing is to get back into the Word. A key way to keep your spirit and your life uh, revived is to stay in the Word. The Word of God should have the effect of washing your heart out every day. You know, um, uh, you know, and I'm sure in your house, it's just like our house, we do laundry every week. We refresh the old linens, right? Well... It's just like that. The Bible calls, talks about the washing of the water by the word. There is something about taking that word and letting your mind run through it that, that revives your mind and brings you back to the Lord. There's another one, interesting to me, Psalm 119, verse 40. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. It's, here's the other source. The word of God is one source, but the, another source is God's righteousness. It's God who infuses himself into our soul and who uh, revives our heart from his righteousness. And here's the one that caught my attention the other day. Psalm 115, 119, verse 88, Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Also, verse 159, consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Now, loving kindness is that famous word, chesed. It refers to God's covenant love. Sometimes it's translated mercy. It has to do with God's loyalty to his people. He's made a covenant with, initially with Israel. It's with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then based on his commitment to that covenant, he will do things for his people. All right, well, in the New Covenant era, we are related to God through the New Covenant. Not through the Abrahamic Covenant, but through the New Covenant. And so God, in his keeping of his covenant with us, we can call on him to re revive us according to his loving kindness, according to his commitment to his promises. If you find that you yourself are growing cold towards the Lord and towards the things of the Lord, you can call on God and say, Lord, I want to love you. Help me love you. All right? That's a legitimate prayer to pray. According to your loving kindness, that you would 
uh, bring about revival. Another one, Psalm 119.93, I, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Well, precepts is a synonym for the word word. Okay, so in Psalm 119, there is a celebration or a meditation on the word of God in every part of the psalm. It's a long psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible. Precepts, a synonym for the word, word. So God's word again is the source. But here in the sense of propositions by which we should live, the Bible gives us. One more, one more. And this is the word ordinances. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. Revive me, O Lord according to your ordinances, according to your regulations, according to your law, according to the standards which you have applied. We're not looking for, what we shouldn't be looking for is that God would just bless us however we want to be blessed, but that we would truly be restored in our lives before him so that we would re reflect the joy of the Lord and have his spirit enthusing our spirits, and that we would be uh, uh, following according to his ways and his laws and his righteousness. And those things would truly be the source of our revival. I found that quite interesting to see all these different things laid out for us in Psalm 119. There's one more thing I want to point out, and that is this, achieving revival. Achieving revival. How do we do that? Here we get Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and a holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. How do we achieve revival? We achieve revival through repentance, through humility, through putting ourselves on our face before God, by making him absolutely supreme over our life. Revival is a renewal of a close walk with God, primarily from humble repentance and submission to God's word. There is sourced, it is sourced in God's character and God's person, but it is achieved when God's people will submit themselves before the Lord. And I hope that this will be help to you as you think about your own spiritual life in the spot that you are in today. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time that we've had this afternoon. We pray that these thoughts about revival will stir us up to walk closely with you and to honor you with our lives and have revived hearts, hearts that are glad to serve you and to be used by you in whatever way we might be, might be possible. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>